Um, and I'm going to give an overview of where, as, as a video game, computer game designer, we stand, a little bit about where the industry came from, uh, where we are now, why things are so exciting, and maybe a little bit about where, we, uh, where we're going, as long as Marcus doesn't chase me off because I ran out of time. So computer games, the computer games industry is actually surprisingly large as, as an industry. Um, I'm just going to briefly, I'm not going to give you lots of statistics, but to begin with, here's a, a pie chart showing, ooh, I'll turn this thing on, um, showing uh, film, music, and interactive uh, at, at retail. Um, this is uh, interactive, and as you can see, it's a fair bit bigger than music, which is really extraordinary, uh, and it's not far behind film. Of course, film have got, you know, box office and everything, but box office is actually a relatively small part of the whole games in, uh, of the whole film industry. So, you know, a very, very major player. And, you know, having come from such a sort of small background as we have as an industry, we get sort of quite pleased with these comparisons. So uh, at about the time, we're a little bit out of date when we come with our figures, so apologies for that. But um, at about that time, um, there was a story about uh, Iron Man, the film, which was the, the big release of Marvel at the time. And uh, they'd set their release date, and they realized that they were going head-to-head -head with a game called Grand Theft Auto 4, that many of you all know. And it was a, a real sort of clash of the entertainment titans at that particular time. Uh, and actually, Marvel blinked first and postponed the release. And they were quite right to do so, because a game like uh, Grand Theft Auto will not only take up a huge proportion of the entertainment money that's prepared to be spent, but also the time. So people just were simply not prepared to go to the theatre, to, to, the, to, to the films at that particular time. So, so as, an, as an industry, we, we feel very proud of the fact that we can very much go stand shoulder to shoulder with, with, with these two. But it wasn't always like that. This is going back to 1981. Um, for some reason, the painter... I mean, of course, everything was in colour then, but um, <laughs> the, 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 reason, the reason that it's in black and white is only because uh, when I googled all of these things, um, all I could find was the newspaper and the, um, and the magazine cuttings. And um, at, at the time, we called ourselves enthusiasts. Uh, other people called us geeks, and they called us very rude things. But we were enthusiasts. And this is uh, a dear friend of mine, Richard Turner, who uh, invited me to get involved in the games industry. He is a bedroom coder. He is sitting in his bedroom. Um, in those days, what would happen is one person, normally quite young, always male, um, would come up with an idea. They then would code it. They would then come up with the graphics, create the graphics, often on bits of graph paper, and work out what the hexadecimal value is and type it straight in. Um, they would create the music using very simple uh, algorithms. Uh, they would debug it, uh, and then often they would publish it too. So it was a, a really extraordinary time. Um, uh, although we wouldn't have said it at the time because we, we didn't consider ourselves to be an art form, and whether we are now or not is a, is, is a debatable issue. But, but in every sense of the word, this was the true period of being the auteur, because you really came up with everything and you went through the whole process. Uh, it was kicked off... Oh, actually, yes, yeah, sorry. And, and just to add, this is um, a, a, what we call the ZX Microfairs, a very fine collection of young men. Um, occasionally, they brought their girlfriends, but as you can see from this, it was very rare. But, but they were just such fun, because these were people who were really passionate about the, the games that we wrote. Uh, and we'd meet them, and we'd talk to them, and they'd give us their feedback. And you know, generally, they'd love what we did, but sometimes they'd be quite rude. But we had a very, very direct relationship with them, which was absolutely fantastic. The industry kicked off um, back in 1980 with the Sinclair ZX80. Um, Clive Sinclair um, pr produced it. Uh, it had one whole K of memory. Um, to, to put that in context, and, and I, I, I just can't get over this, you know, my, my iPhone is 32 gig, so it has 32 million times more memory than, than, than this thing. Um, it was followed by the ZX81, which also only had 1K. And, but the sorts of things that we were doing was writing chess program. We wrote a chess program that actually played a really good game of chess in 1K. It was absolutely extraordinary. So this kick-started an industry that, in the UK, for whatever reason, we were particularly good at. But actually, I think it's 
probably not a coincidence. I think it's the fact that the British psyche is all about, you know, the reason that the steam age, you see, I'm not totally off the subject, the reason that steam, the, the Industrial Revolution came from the UK is because we, for whatever reason, are particularly good, I think, at merging the functionality of, and the beauty. You think of the steam engines. Very much in video games, it's, it's about the aesthetic on one hand, and it's about the technology, and it's all driven by creativity. The ZX81 was actually very well um, and poignantly designed because it didn't last very long, um, but there was always a use for it <laughs> when you moved on to the Spectrum. Wow. Even today, doesn't that look beautiful? 16 whole K of memory, and it was color. Absolutely wonderful. Anyway. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't have one of these in your attic, you should buy one on eBay and stick it there, because one day it'll be very, very valuable. Um, this was my first game. Um, you, you may have noticed, I meant to point it out, but I didn't. That was the logo. The most awful, awful, naive bit of graphics that I actually drew myself using Letraset. All of this was done using Letraset. Uh, Adventure B, it was called Adventure B because... Well, it followed Adventure A. <laughs> the next game that I wrote was called... Well, you know, don't you? You know. Um, and uh, this is ZX81 territory. Uh, you, you know, basically just text uh, where you type in, you know, get branches, heavy with leaves. Uh, and you, I think what you do is you say get leaves, bloody blah, and you, you just follow. Um, so from a marketing perspective, those young men, those gentlemen that were at the ZX Microfairs, they were really happy with this. They didn't care. But as the market grew, we became actually quite marketing savvy. And here we have Inca Curse. Um, very much based on Indiana Jones. Um, still this really shitty logo. Unfortunately, we couldn't quite get rid of that. But um, I, I'm trying to demonstrate that, that actually we, we did learn fairly quickly that we couldn't just simply get away with Adventure B in really rubbish um, font. Um, dominated by a really, really crappy logo. I mean, I just don't know. Arctic, what, why? We've got nothing to do. Arctic's got nothing to do with games. Anyway. Forward 10, forward 15 years. Um, Marcus mentioned Broken Sword. Uh, this is a game that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, so I, I mention it now. Um, it is interesting because... I, I wasn't actually paid for any of the games that I wrote. Had I been, I probably would have been paid about £100. This game, 15 years later, cost just over a million pounds. So in that 15-year period, uh, the cost to produce a computer game had increased by a factor of 10,000-fold. Um, which, again, is like the fact that you're, you know, you've got 32 million times. Just unbelievably large numbers. Um, at, at the same time, 1996... Uh, we, we, at this stage, were still very much the audience was, well, they were the young men that you saw in the original picture, grown up a little bit, but, but many more women, a very eclectic mix, um, very wide and very broad demographic. And then all that changed, uh, also in 1996, with the release of the PlayStation. And the PlayStation was extraordinary because what Sony did so brilliantly is they built a new market. They went into universities, they went into clubs, they convinced young people that this was actually the coolest thing they could do. And the market grew enormously. But in doing so, it was very much tailored at those young people, and those games became much more visceral, they became 3D. And it alienated an audience. It alienated all our core audience, the people that had played adventures, the, what, many, many of the, the older people, dare I say, who, who had loved the computer games and loved the sorts of games that we wrote. But it also meant that games became much, much more expensive to develop. So even million, nowadays, Grand Theft Auto 4 is probably $100 million. You know, hugely expensive. And what that led to was the fact that the publishers then became very powerful because the publishers and the retailers controlled the route to market. And, and here we have a typical publisher <laughs> who ultimately sits there and the sort of irony of it is having come from um, an industry where you wrote your own games and you met the people and you talked, now we had to convince him to commission us to pay one, two, three million pounds to write a game that he thought that a retailer would want to stock in two years' time. And that retailer would stock it in the hope that gamers would want to then buy it. 
So ultimately, you had so many reasons not to take things that the whole industry became extraordinarily derivative and, and, and lacked innovation. Thankfully, all that changed very recently, profoundly and absolutely. It's changed in music. Music fought against digital distribution and lost out really badly. It's been absolutely massacred. Film at the moment is still strong, but my God, they want to know. Luckily, in computer games and interactive, we've managed to embrace it, not because we're brilliant, but because the medium absolutely suits it. And digital distribution has absolutely changed everything. And there are three areas that I want to talk about briefly. Ubiquitous broadband. Everybody can have broadband if they want it, and if they want to play games, then they're likely to have it. So we have the opportunity to send the data down to them and to, to allow them to buy it directly. The big difference is that if you have a retailer, they will take 50%, the publisher will then take 80% of the 50%, then they'll deduct it. So as a developer, we're getting about 6%. By selling directly, we're getting 70%. We're getting more than 10 times as much, 10 times more as a proportion, which obviously absolutely blows the whole business model away. The market demographic. Ironically, Nintendo, when they produced the Wii and the DS, opened up the market back like it used to be. They drew in the sort of audience that had been uh, very much alienated by the PlayStation. And it grew really, really fast. The irony, of course, is that actually the huge market that used to or loved Nintendo are now playing on smartphone. Because instead of playing 20, 30 pounds for a game, they can pay one, or we can get it for free. So actually Nintendo, in a sort of ironic way, have lost out by the fact that they, they, they opened up this market, and then now they're not able to tap into it in the same way. But the big, big thing was that Apple releases the iPhone. Because before that, yes, of course there was phones, of course there were smartphones, but there were zillions of operators, all of whom thought that they should take the lion's share of any revenues. There were game developers who had to write for literally hundreds of platforms. It was a total and utter mess. And ultimately, nobody bothered doing it because it never worked. With iPhone, you have one phone. You obviously got different, slightly different specs, but ultimately, it's, this, it's, it's, it's you know what your minimum spec is, and it's very powerful. <coughs> so that was absolutely brilliant for us. What we did uh, a year or so ago um, is re-release Broken Sword. Remember that it was 1996, so this is 15 years later, and. We, we really, now, one of the Ted Commandments is don't show off. <laughs> one of the Ted Commandments is don't show off. But, but I, I am actually I am going to show off because I'm very proud of the fact that the game, we, 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 we really worked on the fact that it was touch screen and it's got an average score of 91%. Um, uh, it, the, the game actually translated from the old PC to the iPhone really, really well. <laughs> Um, and suddenly we found ourselves as publishers. It was extraordinary. And so we had to learn things, but we had to learn things in a totally new environment. Anything that existed before just fails, doesn't exist anymore. It's not relevant. The, the, the marketing where you spent however many hundreds of thousands of pounds on television or, or cinema, or you bought pages in magazines, that is of no relevance whatsoever anymore. So what we're doing is we're learning at the same time as everybody else. But hopefully, as a small company who, who now understands our, our, our audience, we can do it better than these, these big guys, these big monolithic companies with, in some cases, you know, tens of thousands of people. So just very briefly, you know, this was the icon that was on the, um, for, for our second broken sword, was on the, the, the App Store. You know, people look at that, and they're going to decide in an instant whether they want to buy the game or not. So although it doesn't look like it, you know, the level of the smile, the look of his eyes, the way that we put this blue on, this took a huge amount of time. Now, you might think it's rubbish, and it, and it might be rubbish, but it did take an awfully long time to come up with that, to think very carefully about who we wanted as the main character and what we wanted their expressions, to create a bit of artwork that would tell a story in a moment. Because if this game is featured by Apple, you see that, and you decide immediately whether you buy it or not. But the really nice thing is that we now work directly with our audience again, just like we did in the very early 80s. So if somebody has a problem, they'll email us, and we'll get straight back to them. And so we know exactly what, we want, what, what, they, what they are thinking, what they like, what they don't like. 
which is incredibly liberating. It's, it's very empowering in a way that it wasn't when we had to go through publisher, retailer, distributor, etc., right through to the audience. Uh, Marcus talked about the 12 days of Christmas, and I think this is quite interesting because it sort of shows how different, how, how the market has changed. We were invited by Apple to um, participate for our game, which had been out by a year. At the, beginning of this, at the beginning in January, to participate in something called the 12 Days of Christmas, Europe only, where they actually promote it, we give it away for free. And I'm going to talk in a minute about why free has changed everything. Um, but these were our sales, quite respectable sales. Peak here. That peak is several million units. Several million copies were downloaded in one day. As you can imagine, it destroyed our servers, it's, you know, we, we just, we, we, it was just unbelievable. And, oh, and the funny thing is that uh, it, that was the day that it was given away for free. You can see what the sales were. This is Broken Sword, the first Broken Sword. And you can see how it actually increased by a factor of seven, eight times. So the fact that we'd given it away for free was irrelevant in terms of whether people valued it any less. They didn't. The sales went shooting up. And Broken Sword 2, which is these ones, those sales went up as well. Because what we learned is that this supply-demand curve that's been taught to us, when you get to free, is absolutely irrelevant. It is irrelevant. Because if you give away a game or anything for free to somebody who wouldn't otherwise have bought it, then that's fantastic because you've lost nothing. And what we're learning now is how to monetize all the way up this um, demand curve. Because, um, you know, if we give it away for free and huge numbers of people, and then they talk about it, which they do, or they buy the next one, then that's valuable. Um, and I think probably the best example was um, Radiohead with uh, an album called In Rainbows, which they gave away to their fans and said, pay as much as you think it's worth. Now, that is genius. And the reason it's genius is because that person thinks it's worth that, this person thinks it's worth that, and what they actually did is they did a box set at £40 or whatever for the real hardcore fans. And what these guys had realized, and we're doing as well, is we're actually, instead of having to choose a point, and this is our, our, our money, we're able to monetize at all the points down the demand, down, down the demand curve. Um, and, and so again, like the marketing book has been ripped up and thrown out of the window, so in many ways has the whole economics, um, particularly in digital. So, um, just very quickly, the industry, iPhone, do you know how many of these are being produced, are being turned on every day? Half a million. Half a million Android sets every single day are being turned on. Um, and this is uh, Philip Schauer, who's the vice president of, of marketing at Sony, uh, sorry, at Apple. And what's great is this is his big annual keynote, and that's our game in the background. <laughs> so the exciting thing is that, you know, electronic arts have tens of thousands of employees. We have like two or three. But we are still very much part of the whole thing. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. And so to go back to The New Age of Steam, which I think is a brilliant title, um, I, when, I, when I decided to go to university, I decided to do mechanical engineering. Because I really thought that actually mechanical engineering was going to be the excitement of Steam. It was going to be about the, 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 the creative use of technology. It was going to be about functionality and form and beauty. Um, for whatever reason, it didn't turn out like that at all. Uh, and I ended up um, as being sponsored by, by a car manufacturer, but not say which one. Um, and, and actually, it was very, very disappointing. I am really thrilled by the games industry because it is actually, I think, genuinely encapsulating the excitement and the potential of Steam from 200 years ago. And for any of you who, who are excited by games and who are excited by apps and the whole business, then I would strongly recommend that you really you know, go for it because things are only just going to get more exciting over the next few years. Thank you very much.